Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Fraser River Discovery Center's special presentation on birds of the Fraser estuary with the amazing Dr. Rob Butler. My name is Michael Goodchild. I'm the museum coordinator at the Fraser River Discovery Center. And it is a great pleasure to be able to welcome Rob tonight. So the Fraser River Discovery Center is a nonprofit uh, interpretive center uh, located on the banks of the Fraser River, dedicated to telling the stories of the river from its diverse and vibrant ecosystems to its bustling economy that has brought jobs to over 42,000 people in the province. I would also like to take a moment this evening to acknowledge that the Fraser River Discovery Center is located on the traditional and unceded territory of Coast Salish peoples. Now, territory acknowledgement is just one small part of a reconciliation um, as yesterday marked the start of Truth and Reconciliation Week across Canada, uh, I welcome you to uh, take some time this week to consider how you can participate in reconciliation with Indigenous communities. Now, my colleague Stephen uh, is going to introduce himself. Uh, he has a few words. Uh, Stephen, please. Thank you very much, Michael, and welcome to everyone. And thank you for joining us. Uh, we were talking before we started with uh, with Rob that uh, uh, whether it's uh, virtual or whether it's in person, um, it, Rob's talks are the most well attended of anything that we do at the Fraser River Discovery Center. Uh, part of that we think is because people are interested in birds, but we also know that uh, that a big part of it is is uh, because of Rob, and uh, and uh, both his interest and the way he is uh, he's just so excited to provide the information about birds. So um, uh, some of you have probably joined us before. Uh, in, on, in a number of uh, different venues. Um, we've, uh, we've done it virtually, uh, we've done it in person, we've covered Rob's film that he made called Returned, which is an amazing film, if you ever get a chance to see it. And perhaps what he's most famous for with us um, is the crow walk that he did a number of years ago, where he took us through uh, where all the crows gather in, uh, in Vancouver uh, in the evening. It was, it was spooky, but it was also quite amazing. And we're hoping that we can maybe, maybe, uh, maybe do that uh, again today. And, and uh, I'm looking forward to this because um, as well, it's that time of year when birds, obviously we're in fall, got second or third day of fall, and birds are starting to migrate. And uh, a lot of birds, as Rob will talk about, use the Fraser uh, estuary and the lower Fraser as a stopping point before they keep going, but also to stay here over the wintertime. And uh, you can see some amazing birds that you don't usually get to see. And, uh, and if you do have pictures of birds, please uh, you know, send us a note with a description or send us a note with a photo and we'll, we'll uh, share it on screen. And uh, Rob will talk a bit about that bird. I think it was three years ago for, before the pandemic, obviously, that uh, we went out to the Rifle Bird Sanctuary with Rob. And, uh, in, and if you ever have, have had a chance to go out there, please check it out. It's amazing. Um, we went to see the snow, bird, or the snow geese. Uh, and it's funny, they were delayed. So we didn't see a lot of snow geese, but we saw an incredible number of birds and it was just an amazing place. So uh, I'm looking forward to hear Rob uh, talk about uh, who's coming through and who's going to stay for the winter and, uh, and what's interesting about them. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Michael. Thank you, Michael. Perfect. Thank you very much, Stephen. So um, now I am honoured to welcome uh, Dr. Butler for tonight's presentation. With over 50 years of watching, writing, drawing, listening to and living among birds, Dr. Butler has enjoyed a vibrant and successful career educating the wider community about this important part of North American wildlife. He has published over 150 works uh, for scientific and popular audiences. And this evening, uh, he will be giving a presentation on some of the migratory birds arriving in the Fraser estuary this fall. Uh, as Stephen mentioned, if you have any questions during the presentation, you can use the chat to ask them. At the end of the presentation, we'll do a Q&A. Stephen and myself will go through and ask the questions uh, in turn. Similarly, if you have any photos that you would like to share with Rob, either to get more information or to help identify, or just to share out of general interest, you can upload them to the chat using the little file button. If you go to the chat and take a look in the corner there uh, and uh, you will be able to see them as you upload them. So without further ado, I have gone on quite long enough. Please join me and welcome Dr. Rob Butler. Thank you, Michael. It's always a pleasure to be at the Fraser Discovery Center. 
and uh, to my friends who enjoy birds. Uh, indeed, you know, the migration is on, as many of us who are birders know. Um, and uh, each year during migration, uh, we get some surprises. And this year has been full of surprises. One of the um, really uh, amazing things was just this morning, I got a, uh, an email from Adrian Dorst, who lives over in Tofino. He, Adrian told me that uh, with the change in the weather after that heavy storm, all that rain that came through, in behind it were um, uh, huge flocks of, of geese that landed on the uh, airport in Tofino. And he had white fronted geese, snow geese, and Canada geese all there that had just appeared. They seemed very, very tired, fighting the headwinds. And they had to settle down and, and uh, find some food. So there is the migration going on. And actually, I was up today trying to see if I could hear any of them just flying over Vancouver. When we get these westerly winds, oftentimes at this time of year, you'll see geese going over very high up, but you can hear them. You can see the the skeins as they go by. Some of them are going down to the Willamette Valley. Uh, some of the snow geese are going to California and some of them are coming right here. So these things happen all around us all the time and people tell us about it. One of the other exciting things that's been happening over the last uh, month or so is in the, the uh, Strait of Georgia, the Salish Sea, are uh, shearwaters. These are normally pelagic birds that are found off the west coast. You rarely get them into the inside passage here. But there are shearwaters and there are short-tailed and sooty shearwaters. The bird watchers are going crazy about all this. And there's hundreds of them being seen just in our local waters. They haven't been seen for a long, long time. But um, these particular species um, breed down in New Zealand and Australia. And they move up across the Pacific past Japan and then circle down our coast at this time of year, getting down about California and then cutting across the uh, Pacific and back to their breeding ground. And it's perhaps one of the most common uh, birds that goes along our coast in migration. The uh, current population estimate, I think, of sooty shear waters is something like 25 million birds. So just think about that. I mean, we, when we were working on our book on migration, we realized that, you know, there's lots of ducks and there's lots of shorebirds and all those that come through. But the really big populations of seabirds that go by our coast that most of us don't see was really, you know, remarkable. Also appearing uh, in the last few weeks are lots of western grebes. Uh, my friend Ron Eidenberg was just up, uh, up the coast by Powell River and he saw big flocks of uh, uh, western grebes. The western grebes breed in the prairies and migrate out here. So they, they're migrating east to west rather than north to south like most birds. So that was kind of fun to see them. And, uh, Western grebe numbers have declined on our coast for quite some time. We think that it might be a shift in distribution, I'm not really sure, but seeing the big numbers around is, is really good. And, and with that, of course, there's all the gulls that come with it uh, that feed on, on fish. So these are all kind of exciting and, and good news stories that are going on. And then um, to top it all off, <laughs> this morning, I got up and looked out under the bird feeder and there was a white-throated sparrow. And white-throated sparrows are found in the east. We have a few in the in the northeast part of the province, but they're a species that's found from the Rockies to the east. And uh, finding them out here is quite unusual. I had one under the feeder, which was kind of nice, reminding me that migration is on. And it was with a golden crown sparrow that, that breed in the in the high alpine. So they're coming out of the mountains. So it's a it's an altitudinal migration coming down into our area. And this whole area of the Fraser Delta is really a magnet for a lot of these birds. Uh, and uh, uh, the sparrows in particular will be coming in for the winter. You'll see them all through the shrubbery and so on. And there's quite a few different species of them migrating here for the, for the winter. Many of the birds, of course, uh, will go through. Many of the shorebirds, for example, will migrate on and head on down south, some of them going down to, to Central and South America. But there are many birds that come here and stay for the um, for the entire winter. We discovered this actually when we were doing our our uh, publication. I think Stevens put a link out there to this one that we just finished on the birds of the Fraser. This was a thirty year review of uh, the status of birds, and um, what came out of that was it appears that many of the waterfowl come right here rather than migrating on. There's a few species that migrate down into California and so on, but many of them come here and this is the winter destination for them. So that uh, adds to the, the uh, importance of this, that there's particularly little populations of waterfowl from various breeding grounds that come to specific areas to spend the winter. So, you know, it's important, of course, to consider that, that it's not just 
one species spread all up and down the coast. But these are actually separate populations. One other little observation I've been making for the last little while is uh, uh, when my wife and I go for walks in the evening, um, as it's getting darker, getting closer to dusk, we saw wood ducks flying around uh, uh, up on the hill here. Um, and they were landing in the oak trees. They're feeding on, on acorns. There's about a hundred of them. So they're coming up probably from Burnaby Lake and feeding in acorns during the night, <laughs> which is a real surprise, you know, wood ducks in the, in the forest. As you probably know, um, many of the stellar GAs that are around are also taking those acorns and planting them around in the surrounding areas. Um, the um, stellar jay serves that role to spread the oaks. You know, there's that old adage that the, uh, the acorn doesn't fall far from the oak. Well, it does if there's a stellar jay around. They will carry them off and plant them, forget where they planted them, and up they'll sprout. And it's all part of the dispersal. Uh, so these are all important things that you know, the, the uh, birds serve as they migrate. Um, coming through, uh, spreading seeds and um, serving uh, you know various roles and things. So, what I thought I'd talk a little bit about is just the Fraser Delta itself and the kind of birds that you can expect to see. Um, right around um, our Thanksgiving is one of the best times to see snow geese, and I think most of you probably know this: that the snow geese that come here come from Wrangell Island. The breeding ground is in Wrangell Island in, in, uh, in eastern Russia. Um, and they'll come down here, spend the winter here and in the Skagit Valley, uh, the, the estuary, moving back and forth and so on. Uh, there's another group that carry on further down into California. We have a big population here. I think it's numbering up close to 100,000 birds. And it's one of the biggest spectacles around. And it's really, if you haven't seen this, uh, try to take it in. But the birds will be around in good numbers through the fall. Uh, and uh, you'll see them again in the spring, again in big numbers. But um, it's really worth getting out to, to see that because it's, it's a real special event. Um, and uh, just to be close to them and realize that, you know, this, these birds have come all the way from Russia and they couldn't spend the, the winter with us. It's, it's, it's pretty uh, nice to see. Um, there are many other uh, waterfowl coming through as well. So um, in the next uh, month, October is actually the best time uh, to see birds on migration. We have more species at this time of year than any other. And um, we'll see lots of uh, uh, sea ducks coming in. Um, one of the best places for sea ducks is down at Stanley Park. So if you're walking the seawall, you'll see all these flocks of surf scooters that come in feeding on mussels. And, uh, they'll be here all winter long. So we are a winter destination for those. Uh, one of the surprises we had when we did this work on the Fraser um, is that, of course, the areas along the shoreline have been countered regularly. The um, Coastal Waterbird Survey run by Birds Canada has been recording uh, numbers of birds there for you know, a couple of decades. And so we had a good data base for there, but we didn't really know what was on the offshore in the, in the deep water. So um, uh, about a year or so ago, we um, arranged for um, surveys out in the deep water at the drop-off. One of the things we found out there is that there's you know, good numbers of marbled merlets, which is kind of fun. I mean, that's a species that's pretty uh, unusual to see in the Delta, but there it was right at the, the drop-off. Um, there's also uh, harbor porpoises and dolls porpoises out there on a regular basis. And uh, there's uh, western greaves and uh, lots of gulls and so on all along that, that uh, drop off. So we now have at least a snapshot of virtually the whole delta, what, what uh, the, um, the numbers of birds and, uh, and the common species. Um, the other ones that are, are migrating through and arriving uh, in the next few months are the shorebirds and many of the uh, things like Western sandpipers, these sandpipers as well, they've already gone through and they're on their way. They'll be down into Central America, some of them pushing as far as South America. But following in behind them will be the Dunlum, which are those huge flocks that you see reeling about the Delta um, uh, through the winter. The Dunlum is just a, a small shorebird that feeds on the invertebrates along the, the mud. So if you go to Boundary Bay or, or down to uh, Rifle or to Brunswick Point, uh, you'll see Dunlin for sure. There's, there's uh, probably 40, 50,000 of them here for the winter. So that's a really common one, and uh, they're coming in now. We think that they arrive um, after the migration of, of peregrine falcons. So the peregrines come through in, in um, late August and through September here, um, and even a little bit into October, and there's a wave of them that goes south, and then Dunlin in Alaska come in after that, and then they stay for the the whole winter. And there will be Dunlin all up and down the coast in all these, these estuaries. But the Fraser is one of the 
big spots, and particularly here in Canada, uh, it, it is the hotspot for, for Dunlop. So that's one that you, you can look for. Um, the black turnstones um, have arrived as well, and that's a, a coastal species that's uh, endemic to our coast. They breed in Alaska, they come down and they'll spend their time under the wharves and uh, along some of the rocky shorelines. So that's another one you might want to keep an eye open for. There's uh, lots of them coming through. And then because there's so many uh, ducks and uh, shorebirds here, of course, there's all the predators that come with them. And I mentioned the peregrine falcon. Uh, peregrine falcons are, um, you can usually see them if you watch the flocks of Dunland, you'll see the big flocks go up. And if you just look carefully, you'd see this bird dashing through them. It's likely a, a peregrine falcon. And they also perch on all the wires and uh, on the telephone poles and the, along the trees there along the uh, along Boundary Bay. So if you haven't been down to Boundary Bay, go down, you know, about 70 second, park your car and go for a walk along the dike and uh, just be amazed at the birds. You know, you may not be able to identify them all. But that's not really the point. The point is just to go down and see the spectacle that we have here in, in Vancouver. We're very fortunate. Uh, and the last one I want to just mention is the songbirds. I've mentioned about the, um, uh, the little sparrows coming through. Many of the uh, uh, tropical species like the warblers and uh, vireos and flycatchers, they've already gone, most of them have gone through. But we do have a lot of birds that will come out of the mountains and come down. So things like the um, uh, dark-eyed junco that has the white outer tail feathers, you'll see them, flocks of them. So think about it, they've been up in the mountains breeding and now here they are coming down. And they need this place um, to uh, survive th through the winter so they can go back to their breeding grounds. Fairy thrushes are coming in. We're very fortunate. We have a lot of species here uh, in the winter. Uh, in fact, winter birding is, is, uh, is almost as good as uh, spring and summer. So it's really a great place to, to be. We're very fortunate to have it. So in terms of the Fraser Delta, the, the report that we did, this is uh, David Bradley and James Casey from Birds Canada and myself. Uh, we went through all of the reports and all the information over the last 30 years. Um, I had written one in 1987 on the Fraser, and so we kind of took from that point forward uh, to see what kind of changes had taken place. And back in 1987, very little of the land was actually set aside for wildlife conservation. Much of it now has some sort of conservation designation. And uh, we looked at the Coastal Waterbird Survey counts over the years to see if we could see any changes, which way it went. We were pleasantly surprised to see that many species are doing quite well. Um, so, you know, many of the waterfowl and things are doing well. In fact, some of them are, are really doing very, very well. And it's telling us that, you know, when we do this, do the conservation work, you know, you can be successful and should be happy about it and <laughs> proud that we've actually got these uh, birds and the numbers are staying fairly, fairly steady for many of them. There, there are still some that are of concern. There's lots of them that are on the endangered or the red or blue lists or so on. But, but uh, by and large, um, there's many of the species have, have done well over the last 30 years, which you know, we don't hear about this much. As an example, the trumpeter swans, that, uh, when I was starting my career, there was questions about whether they would survive. You know, they, they really thought this could be the end of them. Well, they're fine. They're no longer on the endangered list. We got lots of them here in the winter. They're doing very well. Peregrine falcons are all back. Bald eagles, when we did the original report, I think there were three nests in the delta. Now there's what, 80 or 90, I think, Miles Lamont told me. So lots of them have come back and uh, it's been a, a great success. So it, it makes you feel pretty good that we've got this. The next step is to what do we do now? You know, we have all these birds here and part of it is, you know, getting uh, people more aware of how lucky we are and what, what we have, uh, get people out to have a look at it. And then hopefully you will respond in a real positive way to that do some really fun things. Maybe it's uh, writing poetry, maybe it's painting, the, uh, drawing the birds, taking photographs, whatever it is that you enjoy doing, you know, get out and do it. And we know now, of course, during this pandemic, how important nature is. So having the Fraser, one of the best places in Canada to see birds, you know, there's no better time than, than now to do it. So I, I wanted to just end uh, quickly with uh, sort of put the Fraser in the context here of um, how far these birds go. Um, birds that come through here, through the Fraser Delta, uh, they span out across the continent. And uh, as I mentioned with those shearwaters, they, they don't actually come through the Fraser, but they're very close by. Um, but if we look at the, the distribution of all of these species, where they go after they've gone through the Fraser Delta, 
you know, we're covering somewhere around 5% of the surface of the earth. And they're going all the way down into um, uh, South America, some of them, many of them into Central America, some are going across the continent. Uh, and, uh, uh, and of course, some going out into Oceania and even a few maybe over into, in, uh, into New Zealand, Australia, and so on. So we have a, an incredible uh, connection to the rest of the world. And it's so important that we all work together on this. It's really an international effort to, to try to do it. Uh, one of the things we did last uh, year is uh, Audrey Benedict, who's a good friend, and Jeff Hammerson. Uh, we put together a book called The Pacific Flyway. And I think Stephen has the connection, I'll link to that if you want to pick one up. Uh, our uh, photo editor went through 8,000 photos to choose the <laughs> photos for the book. So lots of really nice photos. But the, uh, the concept of the flyway is that there's a, a chain of sites up and down the coast where these birds go on migration. So we um, got photos of them and descriptions. And that's all in there. So it'll give you an idea uh, where these birds go. And of course, they go all the way from Alaska and right down into South America. And uh, uh, with the uh, photos, you can kind of see each of those, those key areas, the big areas where a lot of birds go. So to put that into a much bigger context. The Fraser Delta is not an island unto itself. It's much bigger than that. So I thought, uh, you know, um, that's probably enough of me yapping, yapping on here. And maybe what I could do, let's make it a little more participatory. If you've got some questions, uh, photos, or anything like that, uh, let's see uh, if I can help maybe answer some of those and uh, and hear from you folks. So, Stephen? Yeah, thanks very much. So, well, Michael, have a look at the chat. Maybe to start, uh, Rob, um, can you tell us what, what of the birds that come through, either to stay or to move on, which, which, which ones have are come the farthest or are going the farthest through their migration? Well, uh, we do get a few Arctic terns. In fact, they, um, there's a few Arctic terns actually nesting in the Salish Sea now. <laughs> so there are not really Arctic terns in that sense, but wow. it's called the Arctic tern. And that's the, uh, the, the most distant migrant you know, in the world, because all the way down the, you know, you know, into the polar regions in the south. So we do get a, a few of those. And that, of course, I mentioned about those shearwaters going across the Pacific. That's a, a pretty long flight as well. So those are probably the, the furthest one. Right. And you've mentioned before when we've talked, and I'm not sure whether it was just you and I are in one of these, that that um, sometimes because of the winds or storms or whatever, birds end up here that uh, that you, like, you would not expect or have never seen. Um, uh, could you give an example of one of those and, uh, and, and why that, I think it was a small bird that we talked about before and why it may, might end up here and where it was supposed to be. <laughs> Yeah, it happens all the time. You know, birds get blown off course, and all those shearwaters, uh, they're um, I see them in the in the um, they weren't blown off course, but they're in an unusual spot coming into the strait. That's kind of kind of odd. Uh, if you go to uh, the BC rare birds in the uh, bird alert, uh, you can see all the rare ones that come in, and uh, you know, all around the, the local area. Um, so they come from all over. Um, lots of birds, and that's kind of fun if you'd like to see a variety of birds too. To do that, that way-throated sparrow I mentioned is, is unusual. We do get a few here in the winter, but it's kind of a nice little highlight for today. Um, and that's, you know, like I say, that's one of the fun things about birding is you just really don't know what's going to, going to show up. That's great. And thank you, Karen. Just put the link to BC Bird Alert in the chat for people oh, who are interested. Okay. Yeah. All yeah. right. So let's go to some questions. I see, um, Michael, maybe I'll start it. I see we got one hands up anyway. Um, and so if you want to ask a question, you can put your hand up um, and, uh, and then unmute yourself. I think Michael mentioned if you can keep yourself on mute and to, unless you're talking, that'd be great because it's uh, sometimes hard to hear uh, when you're not on mute. But, uh, but Anne Crandall, do you, want, do you have a question for Rob? Uh, yes, thank you very much for the presentation. If you go to the questions at the 7.15 time frame, I posted a photograph um, which we took out at Minnetonka a couple of months ago. At first, we thought they were uh, gulls or seagulls, some kind of gulls, wheeling way up overhead. But when I zoomed in at home on the computer, they appear to be pelicans. Mm. Wow. Uh, I might be able to uh, share my screen. I have the photo on hand here. Just uh, one moment. I love all this technical stuff. Okay, I'm going to attempt this. Let's see. So, add pin. Oh, while you do that, I'll, uh, I can maybe address the question a bit. Uh, 
Um, oh, oh, here we there go. We, Coming up. There we go. There we go. Oh, look at that. Wow. Whoa. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, the um, the uh, white pelicans, uh, you know, we have some of them uh, nesting up in the interior in the, in the caribou, and uh, they migrate largely down through the interior, but we do get them out on the coast, as you can see occasionally. Uh, I've seen a, a small group going up Indian Arm, and uh, I've also seen them up in Butte Inlet coming down, and we get them periodically here on the coast. It, uh, it's exciting to see. Um, my brother in Kamloops uh, has seen uh, a big flock there in Kamloops Lake. Just, uh, just I think it was just last week coming through. But uh, yeah, that's a that's a nice uh, observation to, to see that pick that one out. So, and thank then, you very much. We also got sorry, a, go ahead. We also got a couple of a uh, couple of questions uh, that I received as direct messages in the chat. Um, so I had a question very early on talking about the crows at Sapperton Landing. So he wants to know. Um, should you feed them? Is it legal? Is it ethical? Is it appropriate? What is the uh, correct behavior when it comes to interacting with the crows there? Uh, I didn't catch the first part. Should you do what? Oh, should you them. feed them? Uh, or should, yeah. um, well, the, the ones that are going down to the roost there, um, uh, I think the best thing is just go and watch them. Uh, it, it's really quite a, quite a spectacle. This has just started. This is something new. Uh, they were doing it last year and I think the last year might have been the first, maybe two years. Um, so for people that don't know this, uh, Saberton Landing is uh, in the river just uh, 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 outside of Coquitlam. So it's, uh, it's down by um, United Boulevard and it's an island down there in the, in the river near the uh, Portman Bridge. And the crows uh, at the, um, towards the uh, middle of the summer start to go down and use that as a roost. And um, they take their young ones down. And I think what happens is that they, uh, that roost is used mostly by adults with young because the young probably can't make long flights. So um, gradually the numbers build up and it's quite, quite a spectacle. It's similar to what Stephen was describing down at Still Creek. And then um, sometime uh, towards the end of October, they all decide for whatever reason that uh, it's much more fun to go to Burnaby. <laughs> they all get up. And uh, from then on through the winter, they all go down to that big roost uh, down Still Creek, and like Stephen said, that's a, a, a real spectacle. It's like the uh, snow geese, you know, you got to go and see this. It's a, it's a real spectacle here in Vancouver. So um, that's a new, uh, a new uh, event that um, they, they roost down there. Sometimes they roost in the, um, right in behind the, um, uh, the Home Depot rather than going out on the island. But uh, if you just drive down there in the evening, uh, there they are. Um, oh. So I'd say, you know, just uh, you can go and walk around them. Don't have to worry about it. They're, um, you know, they'll just get out of the way. Um, I wouldn't feed them or anything. Just watch, see what they're doing. It's much more fun. That's great. Thanks. And Nick, I see you've got, um, and I'm glad you put this in the, in the chat. Nick, Nick's from, um, he's an Agassiz, so he's watching from Agassiz tonight and listening. Um, but he makes a good point that, you know, people who are, you know, away from the rifle bird sanctuary or away from the Fraser, um, you know, it's, it takes a bit to get there. Are there any, he asks, are there any deadlines or timelines, Rob, where if, you know, if you, if you go at a certain time, you're, you've got the best chance of seeing the most, or, or I know I, I used the example when we went to see the snow geese a couple of years ago, they were delayed and that's just kind of the way it is sometimes, but is there a, a general window for seeing, um, you know, lots of different migratory birds uh, uh, in the Fraser? Yeah, like, like I mentioned, October is the best month. And uh, generally what you want to do is get uh, around a, a high-ish tide because the, the water will push all those ones that are on the beach, push them up closer to you. So that's, that's a good idea. But, uh, you know, Nick, up where you are, there's great uh, places too, up at the Harrison, up, up that way. And, you know, along the Fraser, there's some really fantastic places for birding, uh, you know, up around uh, the Vetter and all of that. So uh, you've, got, you've got a great spot up there as well. I mean, you used to have Sumas Lake. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it's, it's wonderful. There's so many good places. That's great. You got another got one, another Michael? Another question? Uh, I do indeed, yes. Um, I'm trying to multitask and uh, having limited success, but thank you for all the questions, everyone. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so uh, we did have a question. Where can we get a list of the birds that winter here in the lower mainland? Is there a resource that we can access? Would it be the one that was shared or is there another resource that we can use? Um, if you're looking for a bird checklist, I would go to uh, the Nature Vancouver website and they have links through to um, all the uh, bird checklists in the, uh, in the Greater Vancouver area. So that's a, a good one. 
Um, there is one called Avabase, which is run by Birds Canada that has checklists for everywhere in the world. <laughs> if you want to look, you can just Google in the, or just do a search and you can pull up checklists from all over. Um, so that's, that's uh, really good as well. But the, uh, the Nature Vancouver bird checklist is for Greater Vancouver is, is up to date. It's a, it's a great one. Great. Thank you. Uh, question from Milana um, about ospreys. Uh, are, is there a big a population of ospreys uh, in, the, in the area? Uh, the osprey has been making a comeback. It's another one of those successful species. So um, they are nesting along the river uh, on uh, pilings and so on. Um, they, um, as far as I know, I don't think there's many or any uh, downstream from, from New West. But if you go up into the pit and Harrison and up, up, the, uh, up the river, uh, they're on the pilings up there. Um, so um, they, yeah, they've been making a comeback. There's some over um, it, by Port Moody too. So if you've never seen an osprey, that's a great place to go because they just go down into the Rocky Point Park and you can see them nesting. Okay. There are uh, uh, for people that don't know this, the osprey is a fish eater, and these ones, with uh, some of the work my colleagues have done from here, appear to go to Mexico uh, for the for the winter, and uh, you, know, you know precisely where they're spending the spending the winter and they migrate all the way back. You'll see them migrating on the ridges. So when you get a, a bit of an updraft, you get on one of these little hills, um, you'll start to see some of these birds coming through. I saw a turkey vulture go through. I've seen ospreys go by and golden eagles, bald eagles, all that, all migrating on, the, on these updrafts. And any of those big soaring birds use those updrafts to get the height so they can just go right across the, you know, the delta and uh, get into the next uh, set of hills where there's some more updrafts. And off they go, and, and many of these soaring birds will do this so all the way down to their breeding ground. There's uh, some species that um, uh, they discovered in uh, coming coming through Mexico that uh, there's so many of them that come through, they're pretty sure they don't feed, and they just migrate down through Central America. So at this time of year, in October, uh, well, in a few weeks, uh, down in Panama, um, they, there's so many birds of prey going across the isthmus and right over the airport. They have to stop the flights, and it's oh just goodness. a huge, huge number of, of birds all coming from all over the continent, cramming their way down through that little narrow passageway. And there are places, not, not that many here, there's some up in the Canadian Rockies and on the East Coast where you can actually see large numbers of migrant hawks, and they, uh, they have hawk watches where people count them. That's really worth it. Rocky Point is a good spot over in Victoria. You can see them coming down there and making the flight across Juan de Fuca. So, yeah. Um, you, any of the local mountains, you may see some going by, but the concentration points is where you really want to be. Great, thanks. Uh, Bonnie, oh, good to see you, Bonnie. Um, the, man, the Mandarin duck at Burnaby Lake, I think we may have talked about that before. Is that, um, it's been seen in the summer, is that an example of a bird that was blown off course or is it, is it something that had been there for a long time? Talk about that. Yeah, that, yeah, that bird's been there for a few years now. Um, it's likely an escapee, that would be my oh. guess. Yeah, um, you know, they're, they're over in Asia, and it's possible. We do get birds from there. It, it, it's a possibility it's coming over, but uh, my guess is it's probably escaped. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, I've got another question. Uh, let's see. Yeah, we had a question about um, the snow geese. So do you have any specific recommendations on where would be a good place to, to watch uh, snow geese on the Fraser? Well, you know, the snow geese are getting so tame and so uh, used to people that they are showing up in all kinds of places. The Rifle Bird Sanctuary used to be a good spot, still is. Um, they have some COVID restrictions you know, to, to go there, go birding there now, of course. But they, the geese are starting to show up in parks and uh, farm fields and so on. And, um, I would think if you started somewhere around uh, Western Island and uh, just stop your car and listen, you, you'll probably hear them. Um, there's good numbers that come in at Brunswick Point. Uh, there's some that are coming into some of the parks over in, uh, in Richmond and even uh, some of the golf courses and so on, on the, in Vancouver. So they're, uh, they're popping up all, all over. Um, if you go to the bird alert, you can have a look there and maybe ask some of the birders where they've seen them. And if you're on eBird, uh, the uh, uh, on your phone app, you can see where uh, people have been seeing birds in the, you know, the last few days. So those are some resources, yeah. Great. Michael, I see a couple of pictures of owls. I know people like owls. Can you try and open one of those? I tried to open one myself and it didn't, uh, didn't 
in the I room. can indeed. The way it seems to work is I download the image, then I sh open it, then I oh, share okay. it. Oh, okay. Okay. So, uh, but yes, I can. Uh, I can do that. Just give me one moment. I know, but I've talked to Bonnie about this before. It's 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 in Glenbrook Ravine, and uh, she's she's seen it in a couple of times, including it's a night. barn owl. <laughs> oh, it is. Oh, that's what she yeah. said. Is is it a barn owl? Oh, okay. oh probably. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's what it is. Yeah, yeah. So the pictures are yeah. a little bit. Oh, that's blurry, great. But it should be showing up now. Yeah. yeah. So Glenbrook Ravine, for people who don't know, is just a uh, a park, a creek in New Westminster, um, and uh, the barn owl is a species that's been expanding its range for the last. 40, 50 years, moved into British Columbia, and uh, is now very widespread. <clears throat> they um, sometimes will feed during the day, and uh, uh, you can hear them calling in the in the forest. They're, they're very common. One of the uh, best ways to find them is just listen for robins. Uh, the robins just go nuts when they see these, and they start chirping and screaming. Uh, you follow that, you likely find a find a barn owl. So um, they're very tame, and uh, some of them, and they'll they'll come very close to you. Uh, so yeah, it's a that's a great find. So yeah, nice one. Great, thank you. I should probably also mention that the the owls uh, as a group uh, are uh, one of the groups of birds on the freezer that we're concerned about in particular. Uh -huh. um, the numbers and things are not doing as well as uh, as in the past. And um, I really recommend if you know if you're a photographer. I know a lot of photographers really like owls, and um, it's you know, be really careful around this you know, um, frightening these owls off is, is really a problem. So uh, what I suggest you do, go online and have a look at the, the recommendations for this and just, you know, we really need the photographers to um, to help us out on this one so that we continue to have owls. And what, what's the problem with, with the owl population? Is it lack of habitat that's that's causing them or? It, it, it's partly that, it's a, uh, yeah, uh, it seems to be, uh, we used to have uh, big numbers uh, of uh, short-eared owls. They're still here, still in reasonable numbers, but the numbers have been going down. And um, uh, you, know, you, know, you probably saw what happened when the snowy owls were here and you know, all the people going out trying to get photos and things and moving them along. That's the kind of thing we've got to really be careful about, uh, to be really aware of what these animals uh, need. Um, so um, yeah, some of it's habitat. The uh, screech owl is another one, which has been declining for a variety of reasons. Um, and it's probably related to habitats. Uh, there may be a few of them still here. They're, they're in other places around the Delta, but they're, they're shrinking here on the Delta itself. So, right. um, Another question, is there much of a chance of seeing a purple Martin in the Fraser Valley or in Metro Vancouver? Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, maybe not at this time of year. Um, they've migrated, but uh, they'll, they'll return sometime in about April. And um, there have been boxes. There's a whole team of people who have been putting up boxes around uh, the whole Salish Sea, uh, uh, starting over in uh, Cowichan and then uh, some more local ones. And again, Rocky Point at, um, down at Point Robert, uh, sorry, at uh, uh, Port Moody is a perfect place to see them. Uh, they're nesting in the boxes just right off the, the pier. And you can see them there all summer long. That's an excellent place. There are a few places in the Delta as well. Um, you can see the Mota Diona and some of the other places, but uh, I think it's hard to beat the, the uh, Rocky Point sightings. Great. I see, Michael, we've got an eagle picture in there too. If you uh, want to try and open that one, and mix, put one in there. You're on mute there, Michael. Yeah, yes, I am. I am working on- <laughs> he's, mu he's multitasking. He's uh, yeah. not just doing one thing at a time. <laughs> <laughs> it uh, keeps me on my toes. All right, just one moment, stand by. Well, while you do that, I can start talking about the eagles. So, as I mentioned earlier, the eagle numbers have come back, um, and uh, we're they appear to have stabilized now. So, we probably are back to the carrying capacity, you know, close to it. Um, and uh, lots of them nesting all around here and large numbers here in the winter. Oh, here we are, very nice. That's a young one. Yeah. That's very, very good. Um, so um, one of the things that the eagles are doing is uh, when they finish nesting, they're, they're going to find uh, food and uh, they, um, they usually leave here and go up the coast looking for salmon around the salmon spawning streams. If you've seen any photos there of those streams, you'll see that it's like a candelabra with all these eagles all perched in the trees. So many of our eagles would do that, move up the coast. And so we have a period of time here in uh, August and September when there aren't a lot of eagles around. 
and it makes it much easier for their prey, of course, because they don't have many predators. And it, in that period of time, we start to see the migration of um, ducks coming back. We start to see mallards and widgeon and so on. And uh, you know, now in October, they, they're flooding back in big numbers, lots and lots of waterfall. Well, the eagles, you know, they're following the salmon and gradually as the salmon uh, might um, spawn further and further south, we end up with big numbers in the Harrison River and a lot. And sometime in around November or so, they're getting low on salmon. So they return to the coast and there they are, the smorgasbord of ducks and they start to go after them. Yeah. And uh, one of the things that we uh, had noticed on this is that uh, you know, many of the species uh, had been reported that there were declines going on. Um, we thought maybe because of predators, maybe habitat, not really sure. Uh, so we had a look in Boundary Bay and kept track of where the distributions of these birds were. And for um, uh, several of the species, it appeared that when the eagles returned, they moved offshore. Things like western greaves and some of the diving ducks uh, moved into the deeper water where you can't see them from land. And so it, it appeared the numbers went down, but really they were just you know, further offshore. And uh, that appears to be happening all through the Sailor Sea. The western greaves are out in deep water and you've got to get out there on a boat to actually see them. Um, and so many of them have done this. And uh, this is just a recovery. It's just a response to the re recovery of these eagles. Um, and the, the eagles are also um, stealing the prey off the peregrine falcons. The peregrine falcons love to take ducks, but the eagle will steal them off the peregrine falcon. So then the peregrine falcon goes and hunts the dunlin. So you think of the population of dunlin and the kind of pressure they get is di dictated by when the salmon decide to spawn uh, on the north coast. Shows how connected all this is. You know? Well, and, and I was gonna, uh, 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 oh, oh, there we go. What do we have there? This is a, the bird I was talking to you about, the, the dark-eyed junco. So this is one of the commonest birds you'll find if you have a bird feeder. They, I think it's, it could be number one at, uh, um, at the feeder watch uh, for British Columbia. If it isn't, it's number two. Uh, very easy to identify. So it's about the size of a, you know, it's a sparrow and it's got the black head. The, the male has a black head. Females are a little more grayish. Uh, but you can see the tail feathers, see the white tail feather there? So when they fly, they flash this white tail feather. And um, they occur in flocks um, and feeding on seeds. And they'll be here all winter long. Uh, a few of them stay to breed, just a handful. The majority go up the, into the mountains. And so this is one of the altitudinal migrants coming down out of the mountains for the winter and going mm -hmm. back to the summer. So when you start bird watching, this will be one of your first ones on your list. Hmm. Interesting. Um, you mentioned um, salmon and uh, birds following, and we've talked a bit about climate change and potential impact uh, on birds, obviously potential impact on salmon. There hasn't been a fishery this year. There might be a pink, but we haven't heard yet. Um, in general, have you noticed uh, uh, impacts on migrating birds that are impacted by climate change, or is that uh, not, not, not something you've seen? Yeah, there's lots of papers on this uh, showing changes in distributions and things and, uh, you know, related um, to this. Uh, some of them are uh, where there's changes in habitats as a result, and so they're not suitable habitats, the birds have to go somewhere else. Um, and then there's other ones that, uh, you know, we thought, like, um, you know, Anna's hummingbirds. The, uh, the Anna's hummingbird was very rare here until, uh, you know, a few decades ago, and now it's everywhere, very widespread. Uh, when they had to look at the analysis of that, they thought it might be because of a warming climate. It doesn't appear to be that. It appears to be that we put out bird feeders for them. And so you know, we have gardens and places for them. So all of that kind of plays into it. It's, it's, a, it's a great way to kind of uh, um, you know, look, look at the uh, effects of climate change. But yeah, I mean, th th that is something that, that the, um, you know, with the changing climate, we, we will expect to see this. And it's going to be a response, just like we're seeing birds responding to the recovery of eagles. Change. Yeah. So. Great. What do we have here? We have a nice turn here. So this is the uh, uh, when the, the the turns like I was mentioned about the Arctic turn and the common turn. We have commons that come through here as well, and uh, so they are a fish eating bird and they have extremely long wings. You can see. So generally, birds that have long pointed wings um, are uh, long migrants. The ones that have the rounded wings don't fly as far, and these uh, turns, you know, they make these very very long migrations each year. You can see some along the mouth of the Fraser uh, in the uh, springtime going north and, and again in September at this time of year coming south. And like I mentioned, there's a, an Arctic turn now nesting in the, the Salish Sea as well. So 
Yeah, this is really nice. You see that nice pointed bill, uh, yeah, fish eating bird. Yeah. You mentioned um, nesting boxes. Um, and there's a question in the chat. Uh, are there nesting boxes that are more attractive to some birds or do birds choose them based on the size or how they're built? Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, if you, if you want to attract the birds, you want to make the right home for them. So uh, uh, each species has a, a size of the hole that they prefer. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so it's really important to, to do that. Uh, to if, uh, choose the right dimensions and uh, the right hole size uh, if you expect to get them. Um, there's a few birds that you know, really, really couldn't care less, but many of them do. They really do care. I had a uh, downy woodpecker that was going after a, um, a chickadee box, trying to enlarge it because it couldn't get in. Um, so that's it's pretty simple. If, you don't, if you're too big, you can't get in the hole. But yeah. if you want to attract certain species, then you, know, you need to do the right size box. And you can find all of this stuff online. It's all, all available. Right. So, yeah, that's a, something else you can do in your backyard. Uh, if you have a space, you know, put up a, a few uh, birdhouses. Mm -hmm. We we, uh, we get chickadees nesting in ours and uh, we had swallows and all kinds of stuff. So we've got uh, close to 90 species now that have come through the yard. So mm -hmm. Lots of birds. Wow. Question about Stellar's jays. Do they migrate or are they local and they stay here all, all year round? Yeah, it's both. Uh, we have some that are residents. Uh, and then lots more in the winter. So again, they come down out of the uh, uh, out of the uh, um, the mountains and come down here. And they, I mentioned here, they're feeding on the um, uh, acorns, right. taking them to store them. But here's one of the shearwaters. You see these guys. These are designed for this long distance flight as well. So when you're out in the ocean, they, uh, you don't need to be highly maneuverable. You need to be able to soar and travel. Uh, great distances and the Shearwaters do this. They travel a very, very long distance. Uh, the other thing that's notable on this is if you look at the bill, you can see that there's a little, um, like a little tube on the top. So these, these are, there we are, yeah. See right on the very top there. Um, they have a, um, a gland just the, between the eye and the bill, which is a salt gland. And they use that to concentrate salt and then they blow it out through the, the hole. And uh, so this is how the seabirds deal with the, uh, not having fresh water, they just process it. Um, for some of our seabirds, like the gulls, they have also have the salt gland, but they don't have that um, little tubing piece there. And so instead you'll see water dripping off the tip of the bill in, on a hot day. And uh, that's concentrated salt. For, for, uh, uh, so they can process it as well out, out of the ocean. So these are the things that you know, get out on the open ocean, the pelagic, or look for the pelagic birds. We have things, you know, like the uh, albatross, lay sands albatross, and uh, um, uh, black-footed albatross, just, you know, just off our coast here. They're nesting on the Hawaiian islands, coming over here to feed and then carry that food all the way back to their young ones. That's a whole different world out there. The, yeah, the yeah. Looks like we got uh, another one uh, Michael, a photo of a ptarmigan, but maybe while you get that one, we've talked a bit before, Rob, about on these super long migrations, um, the whole, uh, I guess, process for the birds of, of how much they need to eat and when, and then the balance between eating too much and how far you can fly. Can you talk a little bit about that? I found that fascinating when you talked about it before. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 once you start to study these birds and you see these kind of um, things that they're capable of doing. It's just absolutely phenomenal. So um, we used to think that when a, when a bird was migrating, it was like a small airplane. Uh, it would fly from airport to airport on its migration, stop and then refuel and fly on to the next one. And we're finding that that's you know, partly true, but not entirely. Um, so um, there's all kinds of other things that birds have to deal with, with and it's not just fueling up. So if, if you're a small bird and uh, you, know, you put on a lot of fuel in the form of fat, um, you all of a sudden become vulnerable to birds like uh, peregrine falcons and merlins and the other birds of prey. So that's not very good. You don't want to be vulnerable. Um, so um, you don't put the fat on. If you don't put the fat on, then how are you going to fuel your flight? So they have to kind of balance all that out. And it, it can dictate how far they fly and how, uh, uh, how long they'll stay and where they will go. And so all the way through the migration, this is what birds are doing. They're making these calculations to, to determine how much weight they need and uh, how much fat and what things they'll feed on and perhaps even the, you know, the prey species they will go after. It's really, really critical to them. 
And uh, so we've done a lot of work with transmitters on birds, and tracking them across the, the hemisphere. And it, it's just every, every uh, few months, there's a new thing that comes out that just absolutely astounds you. The, the ability of these birds, like some of them to fly from Alaska to New Zealand nonstop for you know, seven, or seven to 10 days. <laughs> you know, how do they do this? Uh, they can sleep by closing one eye and rest one side of the brain and then alternate and rest the other side of the brain. It's all these physiological things that have evolved to allow the, the migration. It, it's really remarkable. And that's what's so much fun about it, is just looking at this whole dynamic of um, species and how they're interacting with, uh, with other ones. And then of course, there's uh, all the conservation implications of this, that if you change the habitats for them, you're changing the refueling sites for these birds. Right. What do they do? Can they compensate for this? Is there a way around it? Well, they seem to be pretty flexible and seem uh, capable of making a lot of a lot of changes. And it's it's just what's so much fun about, about doing it. So here we are. This, this is a ptarmigan. So this is one that doesn't uh, really migrate. It's a, it's an alpine species, and uh, they um, uh, this one is just uh, you can see it's molting. It'll molt into the white uh, for the for the winter, and then back into the brown camouflaged uh, for the for the summer, and uh, so they, they're able to survive up in the snow all winter long. We, we have uh, some white-tailed ptarmigan along the island, and uh, we have uh, a few rock ptarmigan in the north. And um, you know we're, we're lucky with the mountains and things that we have this variety of, of species uh, to have, have these around. So we think just on some of these local mountains, you might have one of these ptarmigan running around up there. It's, uh, it's great to see, nice photo. That's great. What else do we have? Got time for more questions, folks, if everyone's uh, away. Uh, uh, did we ask the question about northern flickers? There was a question asked about them. Oh, no, go, go for it, did Michael. Did that already? I don't think so, yeah. I don't think so. Uh, might have been missed in the chat. Um, apologies to whoever asked this question. Uh, in the last 10 years, uh, we've seen a considerable increase in northern flickers here in New Westminster. Um, do you have any thoughts or comments on that um, about the specific New Westminster or just more broadly about northern flickers? Yeah, that's true. They, uh, they are more numerous in New West and um, uh, the flicker is a ant feeding species in the, in the summer. So you see them along the sidewalks probing away and they're, they're feeding on ants. Um, I don't know why the numbers have increased. Uh, I don't know if we have more ants or, or what it is, but they, they definitely have increased. Uh, they're nesting in many of the telephone poles and they're even drumming in a few people's houses. Um, but they, yeah, there's lots of them around. It's, a, it's great to see and I, I really don't have an answer why. Another question I think we missed was um, snowy owls in Boundary Bay. Uh, Malata says that she, it seems to her that there hasn't, haven't been as many um, in the last few years. Have you noticed that? Is there, and if so, is there a reason for that? Yeah, the snowy owls come and go. So we have years in which we have the, what's called an eruption of them and they all pour out of the Arctic and we get huge numbers and then it tails off and it goes through a kind of a cyclic thing of every four or five years, something like that. Um, so um, they'll be back for sure. And they, um, you know, they move south every, every few years in big numbers all across the continent, not just here. So I think you just need to wait and uh, yeah, they'll be back. Really? And, and a, a question about puffins. Someone's saying they've seen puffins off the coast of Tofino. Um, mm -hmm. is, is, and that, I think it associates them with being Atlantic birds. You talk about, do we have puffins in Tofino? We do. We have a different species. Uh, okay. On the east coast is the Atlantic puffin. We have the tufted puffin here and we also have a few horned puffins. Uh, very few, but the common one that you see out there is the tufted puffin. Okay, and, that's what uh, I said, yeah. Yeah, they nest on several of the, the islands. They're burrow nesters. Uh, there's a, a big colony of them on Triangle Island, right up off the northwest tip of Vancouver Island. Uh, well, we used to have a few nesting on Mandardi Island, uh, right here in the Salish Sea. So um, yeah, they um, they're they're around and a you know, nice little bird. One of the favorites for people coming out. They want to see eagles and puffins. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, got a, see if uh, someone sent me. Uh, Someone sent me a photo of one of the puffins they'd like uh, me to showcase. So I'm just bringing that one up right now. Okay. Here we go. All right. 
Yes. Okay. Let's do this. Yeah, screen with the puffin. Oh, there we are. Yeah, beautiful. So that's the uh, puffin in the breeding season. And you can see why it's called the tufted puffin. It's got those tufts coming up behind the eye, that colored bill, beautiful little guy. So they, um, they feed on uh, small fish. They line up on their bill. They use their tongue to line it all up and they'll, they'll have you know, five, six uh, small fish dangling out of the bill. And they come back during the day and go into the burrow and feed their young. Um, many of the other birds that are closely related, the auklets, things like rhinoceros auklets and uh, Cassin's auklets um, are nocturnal. So they come back at night. And uh, many years ago, I went to Triangle Island and uh, got to see these at a place they're called Puffin Rock. That's where all the puffins nest. And uh, around the island, there's you know, hundreds of thousands of these uh, auklets that come back at night. And the whole place is just absolutely alive. With all these birds coming and going and about the size of you know, small footballs winging through the air, crashing through the undergrowth and scurrying down into the burrows. And it's just an unbelievable spectacle. And, uh, and during the day, we get spoiled by watching puffins. <laughs> Amazing. Mm -hmm. Question from Tina about uh, magpies, saying that uh, magpie was seen in the local area. Um, and uh, wondered if you could talk a bit about that. Yeah, they show up from time to time. As you know, well, you probably know, uh, magpies are quite common in the interior. Yeah. Uh, they nest there that. And uh, historically, they had been here uh, uh, in the Fraser Delta. Um, and uh, yeah, they, every once in a while, one, one shows up and you know, hangs around, um, usually here in the, in the Fraser Valley somewhere. So it's not unusual, but well, it is unusual, but it's not, uh, uh, it does occur. Huh? Yeah. yeah. We've got uh, we've got about uh, ten more minutes for questions if people want to put any more or any photos. But maybe while we're waiting for that, uh, Rob, we, we kind of joked about uh, only half joking about how popular these events are for us. What do you think it is about about uh, interest in birds with with people um, that, that that just so many people are interested and want to talk and go and go look for birds? I mean, uh, we were saying before we came on that that uh, we've been tweeting out this to people and and we've had people uh, retweets from the United States and from Europe about tonight. Um, and so why do, you, why do you think there is that interest in birds? What, what, uh, what, what, why does it resonate with so many different people in ages, cultures, demographics? Yeah, Let's see we have a nice screech owl here. Oh yeah. Um, I think the, um, the thing about birds is that uh, it's one of the few groups of animals that are easy to see. Mm. Uh, they're all around us and uh, we don't have to go out. Like most of the mammals are secretive. Um, and they uh, come out at night or it's just hard to see. Um, insects are tiny and small yeah, and birds are so obvious. Uh, I think there's a, a real attraction to them. But I, the, the real interest started to grow uh, when all of the facilities came on online to, to mm. bird watch. Things like eBird, which allows you to enter your bird records and see what other people are seeing and, it, uh, and notifications about like the bird alert telling people where you can find rare birds. All of those things help. There's a, a, a program that's uh, on eBird called Merlin, where you can actually record bird songs, play it back to Merlin, and it'll tell you what the bird is. About 90% successful in getting it right. Uh, you can do the same with the bird itself. Uh, I have a, a neighbor who you know, didn't know one bird from another. Yeah, he went to Mexico with this, started to enter the stuff in. It was identifying all the birds for him in Mexico. And he said, this is just so fantastic. And then my uh, son-in-law got onto this, uh, to eBird, and he says, this is so addictive. <laughs> you get going, you know, entering these things, and, you know, all these records are coming up, you know, and you learn them. And he's, he learned his birds in about a year. He got pretty proficient at it, just going online, and, you know, doing, we did a bit of birding together. But uh, I think that's a big part of it, because it's all online, and uh, right. all these things you can do, and uh, just so much, so much information. So Yeah. Uh, and they're, they're a lot of fun, of course. You know, you see the beautiful species and things. And I, we're starting to see other things come from that. People who are doing other things, uh, being inspired by, by the birds. Um, one of the things it does is once you start looking at the birds, you start looking at their habitats, and then you look at uh, the other things that are around them. 
And gradually, what I'd really suggest you do is, uh, uh, you know, many bird watchers just want to see as many species as possible. But what I'd suggest you do is try to understand the birds around you. Watch them, see what they're doing. Like I mentioned about seeing the um, stellar sheet carrying acorns, you know, carrying them off. Well, where are they going? Where are they burying them? And do they come back for them? We find out that 24 hours later, they have come back. They remember where it is. So you learn something there. And you get to know them and they become kind of like neighborhood friends and you know them a lot better. So this is the, uh, uh, the magpie and it looks like it's a young one. Uh, if you look right at the base of the bill there where the upper and lower mandible comes together, it's kind of pinkish. And uh, so that would be a, probably a young one from this year, I would guess. And the tail is not terribly well developed. So it's probably a young one, not very long. Hmm. Yeah, so that, uh, that's very nice. Right. See, we're getting some great photos. I mean, that's yeah. good too. So with the cameras, you know, you can now go out and take photos and come back and have them identified, uh, like Anne's photos of the uh, of the pelicans. Who would have yeah. thought they were pelicans until you took the photo? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So last time we talked, it was just before or, or just after uh, the Vancouver Bird Week celebration. Um, uh, how did that go? Any, any uh, was the turnout good? And were, were you happy with, with, uh, with the event? Yeah, it, it, there were, of course, you know, it was largely online this year. Yeah. Uh, and what we're discovering is that that is really a successful way of doing it. So it's, it's what it's, what's happened now is we've changed it to the Vancouver Bird Celebration. Right. Um, and so it's, instead of being a week long, we can make it longer. And uh, it aligns with one in Toronto called the Toronto Bird Celebration, and you know maybe eventually there will be ones all across Canada. We'll have a you know Canada-wide bird celebration. So um, yeah, the um, the events were well attended. Lots of stuff online, uh, and uh, we were finding that before when we were running Bird Week, because you know if you're going to do a bird walk, you, you want maybe a dozen to fifteen people. So you can't do a lot of people in yeah. a week you can, if you get out and see birds. But if you go online, of course, you can do lots more. So, yeah, it's been, been uh, very successful. That's good. And I know you, you and I have talked about, because uh, different cities can adopt this, right? And they can make it part of what they do. And I know we've talked about, uh, you know, trying to get the city of Westminster to be involved in this as well and, and some of the other yeah. cities. So, yeah. Yeah, we were planning to do that uh, two years ago and then COVID came along. Yeah, that's right. So, so we wanted some... to you know, make it much more uh, region-wide and, really, really get going. Hopefully we'll get through this and be able to, to do that. Because one of the fun things about it, Stephen, is it allows you to share all of this stuff. And we're thinking, wouldn't it be fun to go on a virtual walk at, say, Point Pelee in, uh, in Ontario and go mm -hmm. watch birds in the morning and then come out here uh, and go to the Fraser Delta? And, you know, we can do all of this stuff online. And yeah. We could go on a virtual bird walk or actually go attend it. And uh, we could do a thing all across Canada. You could see all these cool places and talk to people. And, it just opens up all kinds of new opportunities. Yeah, and then it's interesting you say that because I know, I know Karen's, uh, our director of operations is on the thing too. And, we, and we've started to think about how we can do that with all kinds of walks and tours because if you, the technology's there and it's not that expensive. And so you can maybe have, like you say, 10 or 15 people with you, but you can bring along anybody else who, <laughs> you know, who if you film it, if you do it live or you tape it and you do it afterwards, right? So it's a, mm -hmm. it's a way, it's a way to travel for birds and everything else without having to leave, right? So yeah, yeah. Although there's nothing like getting out there. No, that's right. Yeah. Course, so, yeah. but you can bird walk. We got another. Oh, question. sorry, Michael. <laughs> yep. Oh, sorry to interrupt. It's sometimes hard. Um, yeah, we had another question. I think it was about. Let me see. Uh, magpies oh. again. Uh, if this question's already been asked. Yep. Yep. We got me. the magpie. I think we um, got the magpie. We did get the. We got the magpie question so. in yep. US. Okay, yeah, we perfect. did. Sorry, I put, my face is buried in all the no, photos. No, no, that's so fine. I, I come and go. I saw one that came up on the chat. I just saw a bantail pigeon. I don't oh, know yeah, that. yeah. But uh, uh, bantails um, are a, 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 West, a, a Western species found in the mountains here. And uh, it's the closest living relative to the passenger pigeon, which went extinct. Oh, oh. So uh, it, it, it is our native pigeon. And um, we have them um, here going after the acorns as well. If you watch, a lot of people just think they're the regular uh, pigeons, you know, the, uh, that we see around the city uh, when they fly by. But if you look carefully, at, you see, you'll see that they uh, they have a band on the tail and they're, they're all gray and they have a colored wing. They look quite different. Anyway, they're going after the acorns, and uh, the, the same place where I mentioned about the wood ducks. That's where we're seeing these bandtails as well. So we get a flight over our house here 
20, 30, 40 fantails, you know, regularly eating all day, going back and forth to the various um, uh, oak trees to feed on acorns. Right. So that's a nice species to have. It's a migrant as well. Uh, they only lay one egg, <laughs> a very flimsy nest. Um, wow. We're fortunate that we have them here. Right. Oh, there we go. There we go. Beautiful photo. So, um, yeah, look at that. That's fantastic. I don't know if you, you can't really see the band on the tail there, but you can see on the neck, it's got that nice little white piece and uh, this little, uh, little iridescent nape uh, lining along the neck there. So this is this is our native pigeon. Um, so yeah, that's a nice photo. That's a beautiful picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Get these photos as, uh, <laughs> yeah, Stephen, that's what we should do. We should have a, a photo night. People take yeah. photos of all their birds. Yeah, that would be great. Well, maybe we can do that. We'll look to do that in uh, in uh, twenty twenty two. That would be yeah. great. Yeah. yeah. Any final oh, questions uh, for? Moment, uh, yeah. Yes, uh, we got a question from. Oh gosh, um, it was about bird feeders. Oh yeah, we did that. Um, one. Is that the one about there different might have been size? another one. Oh okay. Um, yeah, we had a question from uh, Stephen Fowler about uh, bird um nesting boxes um uh, whoever asked the bird feeders question could you say uh when the question was asked the uh the time stamp that would make it easier for me to find because the chat is quite long at this point yeah. well i can talk a little bit about bird feeding if you like and uh, sure yeah uh, the, the, the kinds of food you put out will attract different kinds of birds of course and if you go down to one of the bird stores they can advise you on this uh, and all the issues about it, you know, things like uh, concerns about maybe attracting rodents and uh, any of those other kind of issues, they can advise you on how to do that. Um, we have a, a feeder on, out behind us and uh, it brings in the sparrows and chickadees and so on. And then we also have some suet. We have a pileated woodpecker that comes down and uh, downy woodpeckers that come right into the backyard and they've got used to us. We get very, very close to them. Uh, lots of bush ticks come by as well. And they, um, they love this. Uh, you know, the handouts. So um, yeah, if you, it, it's a good way to see the birds and get to identify them too, because they're spending the time, you know, they're at, at the feeders. Um, and uh, if they fly off, they're likely to come back and get a second chance to see them. So right. it's a right. good place to, to learn. I have the, I have the question. <laughs> uh, I just located it. Thank you for copying it again. Um, so uh, this uh, individual, um, she has asked, asked about bird feeders. She says, uh, that she has uh, bird feeders and she has them out right through the winter. Now, some people say that we should never feed birds except hummingbirds in Vancouver. Uh, and she would like to know what is your opinion? Uh, she gets about 16 different varieties of birds in her garden um, from her feeders. So uh, the, what, what are your thoughts regarding bird feeders in a, in a more general sense? Yeah, I don't know whether it comes to that you should only feed hummingbirds. I've never heard that one before. Um, the, uh, like I say, it's a good way to attract birds and get to learn about them and so on. Uh, one thing you need to do is uh, be sure about cleaning your feeders, both hummingbird feeders and the, um, the regular feeders. Uh, when they're empty, I always uh, clean mine. So, you know, hot soapy water and make sure that they, there's no, uh, uh, nothing, no remnants around them uh, because they can tra transmit disease. There's uh, salmonella that gets transmitted among the, particularly the finches and siskins. And if that happens, you start to see birds getting kind of woozy, you know, if any of them have uh, growths on their feet, sometimes they'll come in with the infections. Um, you might want to just stop and let the birds uh, go. Uh, we had quite a few of these last year, and it's a good idea to just let them you know, disperse. So don't, don't feed them, just stop feeding. Um, in the case of the hummingbirds, um, particularly in the winter, you know, they, uh, they start to become a little more reliant on, the, um, on your feeders. So you don't want to close that down. Uh, this is a young one. You can see it's just hasn't got all the coloration yet. Uh, the, the little Anna's hummingbirds, we have two here. We have Anna's and Rufus. Uh, so the Rufus is a migrant and it will come through uh, in the spring. They, and a few of them hang around to breed, but most of them go through and breed up in the mountains or up the coast. And, uh, but we do have them around Vancouver on migration. So if you have a feeder, and particularly if you have things like salmon berry flowers and so on, you'll get the, the Rufus hummingbird. And the other one is the Anna's hummingbird. This one is a little guy that, um, it, it, like I mentioned, came uh, a few decades ago and is now very common. It's the, uh, the, the city bird for Vancouver. 
mm. and uh, they're all, all around you. If you if you listen carefully, you'll hear what sounds like a um, a shorty wire snapping away. It's the call from these these birds. It's a very unusual call, uh, so it'll give a give away that they're present. Uh, they're very pugnacious, chase all kinds of other birds, and it won't take long you'll notice that uh, they're around. Now the, the feeders, the usual thing is, is white sugar and water, uh, three to one or four to one ratio is kind of what you're looking for, probably closer to four to one. Um, uh, no food color, just the sugar and water, not uh, brown sugar, make sure it's white sugar and, uh, and the water. And uh, make, like I say, make sure you clean that feeder um, regularly. That's great. Any final, final question, final picture? We're pretty close. Uh, yes, we uh, we do have uh, another hummingbird here, actually. Let's see. Oh, we also got some uh, follow-up information about um, the uh, 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 bird feeders. I'll copy that in the chat while I download this photo. Here we go. And I have so many bird photos to uh, sift through <laughs> on, my, on my computer after this. But uh, it's great. These are some amazing photos. Thank you to everyone who's been sharing them with me. This has been uh, as much of a treat for me to see them as it is to share them. Um, oh, here we go. There we are. And share the screen. Oh, look at that. Beautiful. Yeah, so this is the uh, Rufus. Rufus mm. uh, you can see the reddish sides on it. And uh, that's a beautiful photo. Very nice. Got a, a little bit of a red gorget underneath. Uh, beautiful little bird. They, um, what we think happens with these ones when they're migrating is uh, towards the end of the summer, they move up the mountains to feed on flowers. And there seems to be a migration along the ridge tops uh, going south through. Uh, to the US and they winter down in, in Mexico. And then uh, we'll see them back here in, in March and they, they seem to time it with the arrival of the salmonberry. So, uh, you know, it's one of the earlier migrants, even though it's a tiny little bird, they're uh, capable of amazing things. Hmm. That's great. Uh, okay, I think we're, uh, we're getting um, close to for the time. Uh, there's a question about about yes. sharing the fo sharing the photos um, that all the great photos we've had, um, and and I guess as long as the people who shared them with us don't mind if we share them on our website, we could probably do that. Uh, I noticed that some of them look like they're professionally taken, and uh, um, but uh, I think Michael, we could talk about how to do that. That wouldn't be a problem, eh? Uh, yeah, one one thing I can recommend is uh, if you want to. Um, share the photos with me you can share them directly that i just shared in the chat um my uh, work uh, email address if you'd like to share them with me um i will i would be happy to share them uh, on our social media pages um and give full credit to the uh, photographers as well um just to make sure that's clear but uh that would be probably the, the most straightforward for me and if you have any issues with sharing the photos you could always just send me an email um that i just shared and say hey uh, help me out here. This isn't working, and uh, we can work it out together. Yeah, really. okay. And as for the uh, recording, uh, yes. So the recording will need to go through a little bit of editing. Um, the plan is uh, that uh, the full recording will be shared on uh, the Fraser River Discovery Center's YouTube page, um, as well as on our website. Uh, we will be posting a link to the recording uh, on our social media um, when the uh, recording is ready. Um, if you don't use Twitter all that much uh, and you'd still like to get some notification when the video is done, you can again email me um, and I would I would be happy to let you know when it's ready and provide you with a link. That's great. All right, Rob, give you the last word. Any, any final thoughts? Well, if, if there are some other questions, it looks like from the chat there are, um, you can just send them over to me, Stephen, and I'll uh, okay, yep. answer them. That'd be great. So yeah, so you can add that to the, Michael's put his email in there. Um, feel free to um, to send the questions and uh, and we can forward them on to Rob and, and we can get answers uh, answers to you as well. That would be great. Thank you, Rob. Mm -hmm. well, it's been fun. Yeah. Thanks, thanks to everyone for uh, spending your evening here. 
Yes, and thank you, Michael, for for all your work. Michael set you know set all this up, and uh, appreciate that. And uh, obviously, he's been uh, you know multitasking in the chat and, and social media and, and streaming and stuff. So appreciate uh, appreciate that. And thank you so much to to Rob. Uh, as as I said in my intro, he's become a great friend of the of uh, the Discovery Center. We've done some really neat things together, and it's it's one of those. Uh, great things where he's obviously so passionate and so interested in what he does and it's also such a big part of the Fraser River that those two things come together and when you add in how popular it is with with our guests and our visitors it's it's kind of a perfect match so stay tuned we're Rob and I are going to have lunch and figure out once this COVID thing is gone what can we do in 2022 that uh, it'll be even more fun so thanks again Rob thanks everybody for coming thank stay, you very much yeah, stay, thank stay you tuned. very much you guys all, all right we'll see we'll see everybody again soon take care thank you thanks folks thank you very thank much you. really appreciate it have a good evening thank you.